Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Batman's Broken Batarang. And I'm Gary. And today we're taking a trip back to 1982 for an animated film, The Last Unicorn. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, we follow The Last Unicorn, uh, voiced by Mia Farrow, as she journeys to find others of her kind, being held by the evil King Haggard, voiced by Christopher Lee. It's quite a simple narrative, it's quite a simple plot, and for most of you, this is probably a nostalgia trip. This of course harkens back, for me especially, to films like The Flight of Dragons and The Land Before Time. We find ourselves with The Last Unicorn, and for me, I don't remember this film from my childhood. It's something I had no exposure to whatsoever, and it was recommended to us to review it after looking at some of these other films within that same genre. And I would love right now to say that this is uh, a lost treasure. Mm. But for me, it's... I really wanted to have the nostalgic sort of impact that these sort of movies have on people. And I spent the entire movie trying to find it. And it is it is with some merits. Yeah. And straight away, you're going to notice the beautiful art style. Yeah. Definitely. The animation in this film is is absolutely beautiful. And it goes in hand with saying that this is also part Japanese production Mm. and that some of the makers of this film would actually go on to actually form Studio Ghibli. And we all know that the legacy of what those films are like and what they mean to people still today. The film starts off, though, with The Last Unicorn, as as she self-proclaims to be, because she realizes that there's no other unicorns around. We follow two hunters going through the land yeah and they decide to leave the forest because they don't want to disturb this ancient forest that's being kept alive by this immortal last unicorn stay where you are poor beast this is no world for you stay in your forest and keep your trees green and your friends protected and good luck to you for you are the last then sparks her trying to figure out what's what's happened and we get introduced to one of the most, well, for me, the most irritating character in the entire film. I am a roving gambler. How do you do? A stupid butterfly? <laughs> <sighs> this is it. I mean, when, when we start talking about unicorns, there's a lot of magic behind them. You know, you look at films like like Legend, you know, when they talk about unicorns having all this magic inside them and protecting the realms that they're in and we follow this last unicorn the hunters explain that they're not going to find any game to hunt in this forest because they're protected by this unicorn and yeah she starts to think hold on a minute where the fuck is everybody else i haven't i haven't seen a single unicorn for the whole of my lifetime then we come across this weird butterfly thing i i i started to really question the film at this point because you know, it's kind of set in a, a medieval realm, yeah. in, a, in a fantasy kind of realm. But he starts quoting songs. See you later, alligator. Close cover before striking. You know, and, and film quotes. And I'm like, okay, so now we're in... It, it, this butterfly comes from present day. He's just happened to turn up in this forest <laughs> at this point. Well, they go. The, she explains that butterflies never give straight answers, that they only ever reply or talk in song or in rhyme or in poetry. Yeah. So she's just left even more confused, as was I, (laughs) at this butterfly's explanation as to where the other unicorns have gone. And she gets enough nuggets of information from this butterfly anyway to actually go on a quest. Yeah, the, uh, the, the butterfly explains about the red bull. Yeah. The red bull, I... I... Doesn't it give you wings? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> every time I kept thinking that every time they mentioned the Red Bull uh, all I kept thinking is it gives you wings you know <laughs> at ch- child of 2000 you know you'll get that but uh, yeah the, the Red Bull is quite terrifying you know you find out that this 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 bull had forced all of the other unicorns to King Haggard King Haggard had stolen them all and he'd used the Red Bull to make them come to him and you just, it reminds me of the monster from the Forbidden Planet. You know, the first time you see that that giant red form kind of in front of you, and this this bull is, yeah, really quite terrifying. But she she wanders out of the forest at that point and comes and across, and we are treated 
to America! <laughs> <laughs> This folk band uh, that pretty much uh, breaks the movie up every sort of five to ten minutes of the movie. With a it's song. time for America and another song. And you see, I love the songs in the Flight of Dragons, or just that one song in particular. Yeah. But the songs in this were—they're not memorable at all. They—they they were just—they were just filler. They just kind of broke up the scenes delayed the pacing yeah. and were just really derivative and tr and half assly sort of explaining who these characters were or the world that they're existing in but it was just so lame see I got the first song the first song that came out you know the last unicorn over the credits worked really well then the next couple of songs I'm like okay I'm, I'm still with it then as the film went on and more and more songs started coming I was just like Jesus Christ is this a sing along I, I'm wanting to focus on the story but you keep just chucking this song in front of me, which I'm not even really remembering, and I kind of forgot what was happening leading up to that point. Well, that point being is that whilst the unicorn is sleeping, uh, some uh, a carnival, Mama's... M Mama Fortuna. Mama Fortuna's carnival band comes along and finds the unicorn, and I thought this bit was interesting, that she straight away knows that it's unicorn, but the men in this universe yeah. can't see unicorns for what they are. They only ever see horses, like just normal. Yeah. And so she captures the unicorn and puts it in, in, a, in a cage next to a lion, a snake, a monkey, and a harpy. Yeah. You, and Mama Fortuna uses her magic to convince people that these with, uh, other withered creatures are actual mystical creatures. The, the broken down lion is a manticore and the... The starving snake is is the Midgard serpent. I, I kind of got confused at that point because the little hunchback guy is com explaining all the animals to the people, and he's like, "Yes, this Midgard serpent has the world in its grasp." And I'm like, "Well, it's in a cage." <laughs> <laughs> and here's where the film could be considered slightly risque in the fact that this harpy is pretty much naked and it has three yeah. breasts. Three breasts. What's that? Mm, yeah. Well, I can't complain about three breasts, but. Uh, <laughs> but, it sounds like a, a dude. <laughs> the, weird, the weird thing is, I mean, this is half hour into the film. She, the unicorn's been captured. She's been held by um, Mama Fortuna, voiced by the the always excellent Angela Lansbury. But the harpy is ready to kill Mama Fortuna and her hunchback well, as soon it, as it gets out the cage. That's because it's a real harpy. Yeah. Un unlike the others. Yeah. But, but this is the thing. Half an hour in, the harpy is let out by the unicorn and kills these two people. And I'm sat there like, okay, I'm definitely in an 80s movie now because they aren't afraid to kill people off. Not alone! You never could have freed yourselves alone! I held you! <laughs> here, kids, here's a couple of dead bodies. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's also here that we get introduced to perhaps my favourite character of the entire film, and that's the wizard. Yeah. And we sort of get the impression that he's a bungling wizard. He's uh, an apprentice, if you will, because he can't control his magic. It seems random. Yeah. But what he always says is that when the need really arises for him to have to use the magic, that's when it works at its best. Yeah. And so, yeah, he frees the unicorn... They have the scuffle with the harpy. Yep. And the two of them escape. And then they come across some more bandits on the road. So they decide to hide. The wizard gets captured by the bandits <laughs> and taken back to their hideout. Yeah. And there's a couple of humorous bits of dialogue here where the wizard creates an illusion of Robin Hood. And, and Maid Marian. And Maid Marian and the Merry Men walking through the forest. And these outlaws are like, no, well, the, the, well where are we going with them? <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of just leaves Captain Cully, and I think it was his wife. Yeah. Um, Captain Cully also disappears and just leaves his wife there, and she's like, well, I'll join the wizard and the unicorn, because <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So then the three of them continue on this adventure to try and find the remaining unicorns. And that's, of course, where they get attacked for the first time by the Red Bull. 
And sort of the linchpin of the film here is where the wizard casts a spell to hide the unicorn. Yeah. And sort of inadvertently, maybe deliberately, turns her into a woman. Yeah. And again, we have more nudity here, but with some strategically placed long hair, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and the, as I said, the linchpin of the movie is then this last unicorn in the form of a human body. And she spends pretty much the majority of the rest of the film in this human body to the point where she starts to forget that she's a unicorn. Yeah. And for me, that's there is where the morality and the fable of this story really comes through. I'm a unicorn. I'm a unicorn. Don't. Don't you hurt yourself. Be still. The magic knew what it was doing. In this shape alone, you have some hope of reaching King Haggard and finding out what has become of the other unicorns. I wish you would let the Red Bull take me. I wish you had left me to the harpy. I can feel this body dying all around me. I, I do love this bit. I mean, the adventure up to meeting King Haggard was kind of all over the place. There wasn't any real, apart from obviously the harpy, everything after that, there wasn't any real peril. It was pretty whimsical. Yeah, and then they get to the, they get to the Red Bull, she becomes human. And I, I thought that was quite, quite a surprise. I, I didn't actually expect that to happen. Um, but they come across King Haggard then, uh, voiced by the ever so awesome Christopher Lee, and he his presence on screen. You've just got this, well, haggard old man living in this derelict castle, and I I try to try to not think too realistically about it. But I'm sat there and I'm like, well, what did they eat? It's just him and his son, <laughs> Prince Lear. Oh, and, and they have a, a castle wizard as well. Yeah, the, the prince was voiced by Jeff Bridges. But I'm just like, okay, so there's these, there's these two guys in this castle. You guys must have food around. Nope, look around the land. We've killed pretty much everything. So what the fuck are you eating? <laughs> I don't know. The prince is always out hunting dragons and other mythical creatures. Maybe they're just eating that. The, the dragon. i got to bring up the dragon. When the prince goes out to fight that Chinese dragon, if you listen carefully, it's Godzilla. They, keep their secret. they stole the Godzilla sound for this Chinese dragon. And I was just like, you cheeky bastard. <laughs> I didn't actually notice that. <laughs> what I also didn't notice was Jeff Bridges. Because the Prince character in this movie is just such a dope. <laughs> yeah, he, he is just absolutely... Jeff Bridges, though. He, true. He's the dude. <laughs> but I just wanted to slap this Prince so hard. And, I mean, just lately, recently, over the last few years, there's been a certain kind of movement... We call these the bronies. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there's also that silly rule. They're, and their horses have been fetishized over the years. Yeah. And I was sort of afraid to go in. I don't even want to go into that area. That's just a horrible gray area. Yeah, yeah. And the prince falls in love with the unicorn in her human form. Yeah. And he's, he's obviously unbeknownst that it is a unicorn. Up until the point where... He's told, it's actually a unicorn, that this can't happen. And he's like, that's my love. Yeah. I love a horse, I'm oh. going to love a horse. And I was just like, oh, here we go. Unicorn, mermaid, sorceress. No name you would give her would surprise or frighten me. I love whom I love. Well, that's a very nice sentiment. But when I change her back into her true self... I love whom I love. <laughs> Maybe that's where it all started. <laughs> he was the original brony. Jeff Bridges. <laughs> Jeff Bridges the dude. I... I I couldn't believe Jeff Bridges broke into song. I've had time to write a book about the way you act and look. I haven't got a paragraph. Words are always getting in my way. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've, I've watched a lot of Jeff Bridges movies. I can't remember. I mean, maybe uh, it was when he played the aging musician. But then hearing him sing in this movie, I was just like, okay, Jeff, you really need to cut back on whatever you're smoking. 
<laughs> well, I could tell that his father in this film was the villain straight away because yep. he had those sunken red eyes and he was twitching with his beard. And also the the, ha- the, the castle wizard that they already have also looks like a villainous wizard. <laughs> yeah. But they decide to get rid of him anyway with a good reference. <laughs> yeah, that's I, 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 that's funny. <laughs> Come on, old man. I'll write you a reference. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a reference. I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> now you're just taking the piss out of me. You're, you're chucking in all these film references, all these film quotes, and now you're gonna give this wizard a reference. You're gonna email it to them, <laughs> you know? I expected that wizard to come back. I, I expected yeah. him to do something. But he's like, oh, you, you brought this curse on your house, King Haggard, and you brought your doom in. See ya. <laughs> Cloud of smoke. Cloud of smoke. So the illusion now is that they are going to stay at his castle and try and make him happy. Because that's the thing. Nothing makes this king happy. So the wizard is just coming up with... He's doing juggling tricks. Well, he's doing disappearing tricks. And... The only thing that made him happy, he explains, was seeing unicorns. So this is the reason why he got all the unicorns in the world using his Red Bull. To, and he forced them into the ocean so he could stare at them and be happy. And at this point, I was just like, right, okay, so you've forced all these unicorns into the ocean and you're going to stare at them, but you still look miserable as fuck, you know? And then he he sees the princess and he starts to realize that she is the unicorn, but the longer she stays in human form and starts to fall in love with Prince Lear, the longer she... She will forget she's a unicorn and she won't turn back. So then I'm like, okay, is that making you miserable? You, what? Yeah? Uh, I, I don't know. But then if I was living in a castle that looked like it was about to fall into the ocean at any minute, I probably wouldn't be too happy <laughs> living there either. <laughs> what I do like again here, though, is the art style because that castle was gothic. It yes. was the, all of the detail in just the walls... Uh, the, just the building itself, it was very dark and foreboding. And I just loved looking at all the distorted faces in the walls. And when some of the characters start exploring in some of the dungeon areas, it's, yeah. it's really well really well designed. Yeah, I, I, I particularly like the clock. I mean, yeah. they, they, the, the main characters realized that the layer of the Red Bull was hidden behind this magical clock. And they have to work out a riddle to get past it. But you just see this clock and it doesn't work. It's fucking broken, you know, time. It does never tell the time. But I was looking at it, I was just like, wow, if, they, if you could make that, you, I, I'd have that in my home. Uh, I think my favourite scene in the film probably comes from them coming to face-to-face with this talking skeleton. Mm. They need to figure out how to get to the Red Bull and to rescue the unicorns, and they come across a skeleton that knows the answer, but he's not going to give it to them. Unless, of course, he has some wine. Give it to me if you don't want it, but don't throw it away. But you're dead. You can't smell wine, can't taste it. But I remember. And throughout this entire scene, I was just enjoying the banter back and forth. I was enjoying the accent on on the skeleton who would turn out to be Odo from Deep Space Nine. (laughs) (laughs) I'm so used to being so straight and stern, but uh, just seeing that was just, it was quite hilarious. Um, And I like the way that plays out. And I just couldn't help but shake the image of Murray from Monkey Island 3. I can't remember which one it was called, but it was (laughs) the third one. The old demonic powerful skull. Just... (laughs) Um, I also really liked the cat as well. The cat with an eye patch and uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, a stump for a leg. Yeah. I just loved the way that it sounded like a pirate captain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just... Uh, and of course, when the cat explains that never gives a straight answer to a human, I was just yeah. like, it's just great. So there's nice little touches in the film that I really do appreciate. Why won't you help me? Why must you always speak in riddles? Because I be what I be. I would tell you what you want to know if I could, Mum. But I be a cat, and no cat anywhere ever gave anyone a straight answer. <laughs> uh, my favourite scene, uh, barring Christopher Lee as this fucking evil presence as King Haggard, there's a scene where the magician, uh, the, the wizard, casts a spell on a tree, and the tree comes to life. 
and it's a female tree with humongous breasts. And she loves this guy because he's brought her to life and grabs him and shoves his head into her boobs. I thought that was awesome. Love you. Love, 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 love. When no other in the world remembers your name, there is no immortality but a tree's love. Oh, God, I'm engaged with Douglas Fir. Uh, well, he, t- he was tied to the tree as well already, so he couldn't move. And I was like, well, there's worse places, I suppose, to be stuck. <laughs> I can only recommend this film to people that have a nostalgia for 80s animated features. Yeah. Especially if you've seen this film in your childhood and you've forgotten about it, go back and watch it again. Because there's enough in there to, to spark off again your imagination of innocence and, of course, un- uh, go through this morality tale. Yeah. You've also got to remember that this isn't Disney, it's not Pixar, mm. it's an independent uh, feature, and it's always interesting to see something produced that way when you're looking at a piece of art or, or a film. However, to the masses and to our subscribers, I probably can't recommend this film unless you are interested in, in animation, art styles, yep. character designs, or anything like that. Otherwise, the film... It can really grate on your nerves, especially with the amount of songs that are in there, yeah. which just don't really add anything. They don't add any feeling or meaning, uh, or they didn't to me in the film. Uh, but what I really did enjoy was the escapism, the fairy taleness, um, actually uh, caring for this unicorn. Yeah, uh, I did in small doses, but for me, I was I enjoyed watching the wizard and the perils of him going through this film. Yeah, just like Gary said, I mean, this, this story is for any children of the 80s. You know, if you've grown up watching art style like this from Flight of Dragons, Land Before Time, He-Man, Masters of the Universe, Thundercats, all that kind of cartoony kind of magical animation, it works. For, for people born of a different time, you might look at it and just be like, meh, really? But... You take it or leave it. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Guybrush Threepwood, a mighty pirate. I'm Murray, the demonic skeleton. (laughs) 